Hi everybody, and thanks for watching um, or rewatching. Um, hopefully, this lecture is a bit of a help for you in getting everything going for your class projects. So, um, we've already talked a little bit in class, more than a little bit. We've talked about the main equation for our project in class, but I wanted to review that a little bit and then get into some of the stuff with the boundary conditions assembling the main equation into something that you can use for actually assembling it in MATLAB so that you can build your model and get it to run. So uh, what I've done here is put together a bunch of slides that are going to look somewhat like what you might see on the board in class as if I was standing there in front of you going through this. I can't actually point at anything here because the way I put together the video you're just going to see the slides and you're going to hear my voice. Um, I've also put together the slides as a PDF file so um, you should be able to download that from the Canvas page right next to uh, where you clicked to watch this video or I guess listen to this video. Um, I think it would be very helpful if you have those slides available in front of you uh, either printed out or on screen in one way or another. And then I'll go through the video and kind of point at each part of the slide that, or mention what, what parts of the slide you ought to look at. Um, okay, so to start reviewing a little bit about how we constructed our main equation for the project. So at the top of this page, you can see at the left a uh, representation of the grid that our basically our map grid that the entire um, entire project is going to be based on. So each grid square, now there's 25 grid squares in the picture you're seeing. What you're actually going to have is um, 2,500 grid squares in your actual model, but nobody would like watching me draw 2,500 grid squares, and it would take up multiple pages, and you wouldn't be able to see anything of interest here. So I'm just going to draw 25 to represent our much larger grid. Um, so that's what's on the left in the upper part. In the middle in the upper part, um, I'm showing just what happens at one single grid cell, the one in the middle that has a green uh, outline in it. Now, the groundwater flows in and out of that central grid square are affected by the hydraulic head in the four surrounding grid squares. We only get flow across the straight flat faces. So Nothing across the corners. That would be extra complication that I don't think would add anything. So we're not doing that. We're just going to get those four flows in and out of the central grid square. Um, we can calculate what those flows might be, or approximate them anyway, using Darcy's Law. So now we're into the right side of the upper part of the screen here. Um, so Darcy's Law says Q, the Darcy velocity, is equal to negative k, the hydraulic conductivity, times the gradient of hydraulic head, h. We want the k value not in the middle of the grid square, but we want the k value that's right at the boundary between the two grid squares where we're measuring the flow. So we can determine that k value as an average between the two k values on either side of it. Um, so the example I've written on the screen here shows you um, as if we were working with the grid square to the right at ki plus 1j. So using the geometric mean, not the arithmetic mean, but the geometric mean, we take the product of kij, that's the k in our current central grid square, multiplied by ki plus 1j, so that's the hydraulic conductivity in the next grid square. And this is going to work in any direction. We're just looking at the right-hand direction as an example here. So we take that product, take its square root, and that's going to give us the k value at the boundary. Now, the hydraulic gradient, or gradient of H, is going to be the difference between those two hydro, uh, hydraulic, uh, I'm sorry, hydraulic head values between the next grid cell and the current grid cell. So HI plus 1J minus HIJ divided by their separation distance, which is delta X. So this is a forward finite difference uh, approximation for this gradient. Now this approximation can be applied in all four directions, one at a time. 
and that's how we form our physical form of the equation, which is the uh, lower part of the screen on the left side. So on the lower part of the screen on the left side, we have four major terms plus a minor term for our QIO values. But each of those four major terms, we have a downward term, a leftward term, a rightward term, and an upward term. Each of these terms are pretty similar. The differences are primarily found in the uh, indexing that we use. So the if we're looking down, we're looking at hij and hij minus 1. If we're looking to the left, it's i minus 1j instead of ij minus 1. To the right, it's going to be i plus 1j. And up, it's going to be ij plus 1. The other difference between each of these terms is the uh, separation distance that we divide by in our finite difference approximation. So for a vertical motion in the y direction, we're going to use delta y. And for a horizontal movement in the x direction, we're going to use delta x. Now, I really shouldn't call it vertical because everything's horizontal. It's uh, left and right versus up and down. Um, but we're all actually horizontal. This is all in map view. So I, anything vertical is kind of a different hydrology problem beyond what we're actually trying to accomplish here. Um, the last term, the QIO divided by A, that is the um, input and output of water term by things other than lateral groundwater flow. So that's going to include wells and grass, etc. So on the left side, we have the physical form of the equation. If you apply some algebra to this and rearrange the equation, you get the form on the right, which is the linear equation form. These are the same equation on the left side and the right side of the screen. The only difference is on the right side, we've done some algebra and done some collection of terms. And we set up this equation so that it is a linear equation that um, is of the form ax equals b. So this is our typical linear equation form. When we have it set up this way, we have an A matrix that contains all the coefficients, an X matrix that contains all the unknowns, and a B matrix that contains all the constants. For our problem here, the unknowns are all the H values, the hydraulic head values. So those are what's going to go in, a, in the X matrix. Um, as you can see on here, I've kind of color-coded everything. So anything that's going to go in the A matrix is colored in blue. Anything that's going to go in the X matrix is colored in red. And anything that's going to go in the B matrix is colored in green. I've also made, a, made note of the directions as they translate from the physical form of the equation on the left to the linear form of the equation on the right. In the physical form, we have basically four major terms for down, left, right, and up. Those directions propagate across into our linear equation form as well. However, they show up twice in the linear form of the equation. We have one term each for down, left, right, and up. We also have a diagonal term in the middle, which contains um, four parts, which are the down, left, right, and up parts. Now, if you look carefully, the down part of the diagonal term in the middle, that's the long term in the parentheses with, that's multiplied by hij. If you look carefully at the down term in, inside those parentheses and the down term further up, the uh, kij, kij minus 1 over delta y times hij minus 1, the coefficients are the same there. So if you look carefully at that diagonal term, it's equal to the sum of the absolute values of the other terms, of the other coefficients, I'm sorry. So each of those coefficients appears twice in this equation. Once as its own term with an hi j minus 1 or hi minus 1j or hi plus 1j or hij plus 1 term, and once in the diagonal as well. So that means the absolute value of the diagonal is greater than any one of the absolute values of the other coefficients. And it's equal to the sum of the absolute values of all the other coefficients. So that means this matrix is going to be diagonally dominant. It also means there's not going to be any zeros on the diagonal. 
which is important because knowing these two things, we don't need to do any kind of corrections before we can run this into the gauss seidel method. So we can actually run the gauss seidel method without any zero checker or anything like that when we're using this set of equations. The other thing I want to point out is the QIO over A is moved over to the other side of the equal sign here, and it's negative now. This is constant values. All the QIOs that you're going to use are given. All the areas that they are applied over are given. And so that's all constant information. So none of that needs to be on the side of the equation with unknowns. That's all known. That all ends up in the B matrix. So when you are calculating your well pumping rates, uh, or your well pumping rate divided by its area, that's going to appear in the B matrix. Okay, so that's our main equation. So that brings us to the next part. Now we want to talk a little bit about how we're going to actually assemble these matrices. So there's a few things we need to kind of make sure we're clear on beforehand. So if you look at the top part of the screen here, uh, and this is page two now in the packet that you should have downloaded. Um, in the top part of the screen, there's a system of three equations and three unknowns. Um, now I don't recommend trying to solve this in the gauss seidel method. I made these numbers up and just slapped them down on the piece of paper. I have no idea if this is actually solvable. Chances are it's not. So don't try to solve it. Just kind of, I want to look at this in terms of how we go from the equations to the matrices. And so that's what we're showing at the top here. Um, so we, in blue, we have the coefficients. In red, we have the unknowns. In green, we have the, um, the constants on the right side of the equal sign. So if you write these out into matrix form, we have an A matrix, which contains in the top row, 4, 3, negative 6. In the middle row, negative 2, 6, negative 1. In the bottom row, 3, 1, 4. We have a B matrix that contains 14, negative 4, and 7. And then we have an X matrix that's going to contain the unknowns, X1, X2, and X3. If we had this same setup, but now we're looking at the next set of equations below it here. If we had the same setup, basically the same equations, except in that third equation, there is no X1 term. So we have 4X1 you know, plus 3X2 minus 6X3 equals 14, negative 2X1 plus 6x2 minus x3 equals negative 4, and then x2 plus 4x3 equals 3. If we want to write this out in matrix format, we still need to account for the x1 term in the third equation. In this case, the coefficient for that x1 term is 0. So we still put a 0 in that A matrix. I didn't write out the B and the X matrix, because those are basically the same. Almost. I mean, there's a 7 at the bottom of the B matrix and a 3 at the bottom of this B matrix, but it doesn't matter. These aren't solvable problems anyway, so it's not really terribly important. What's mostly important here is what happens when one of the unknowns in one of the equations uh, doesn't exist in that equation. Turns out it actually does exist, it just has a coefficient of 0. So this is going to apply also for our main equations for our project. So now we move down to the bottom part of the screen here. Each unknown has its own equation. So every single grid square in your model, I've drawn 16 grid squares here, 4 by 4. We're working with a 50 by 50 grid that's going to have 2,500 grid squares. In both cases, so in this case it's 16 equations for 16 unknowns. For our problem we're going to have 2,500 equations for 2,500 unknowns. Now just like what we were looking at above here, each equation has a term for all of the unknowns, even if the unknown does not appear in the equation. When that's the case, the coefficient is zero. So just like we saw up here in the third equation from the second set of equations, we still need that zero in the, um, in the A matrix. So, I've written a little shorthand version of our main hydrologic equation here. So, where you see things like f of k6, f of k9, uh, f of k11, f of k14 down here, each of those represents that uh, square root of, uh, in this case, it would be something like k10 times k6. So square root of k10 times k6 
divided by delta y. Um, so that's what f of k6 would be. f of k9 would be the square root of k10 times k9 divided by delta x, etc. In the middle here, on the h10 term, you see we have the sum of all the f of k6, f of k9, f of k11, and f of k14. So that's our diagonal term. Now, this is what our equation looks like physically. In order to make this work as a uh, linear equation, we have to account for all of the unknowns in every single equation. So this equation needs a term for, x, uh, for h1, and for h2, and h3, and h4. So we get the form of that equation that's down on the bottom. Now on the bottom, I've underlined each of the terms that appears in this first version of the equation. But on the bottom, I've also added on all of the terms for the h1, h2, h3, etc. They're all zeros, but we need to account for those zero coefficients in order to populate our main A matrix. So let's move on to the next slide here. We're moving on to slide number three here. And this is going to show how we're going to build those equations. So what I've done here, I've just made a 3 by 3 grid because 9 equations and 9 unknowns is plenty to accomplish the task of describing how this is all going to work. Um, so I've written out the equations here. Um, and I've given each grid square a number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That way we have some kind of identifier for each of our equations and each of our unknowns. So for our first grid square, number one, our equation, uh, just using our, uh, going from our physical hydrological equation to our linear equation without dealing with any of the zeros is gonna be uh, the sum of f of k2 plus f of k4. So just like I described last time, this is shorthand for uh, all the square roots of k times k, etc., and all that. So f of k2 times plus f of k4 times h1 uh, minus f of k2 times h2 minus f of k4 times h4 equals negative qi over a. So that's our first equation. Now, again, this equation only accounts for the things we're actually interested in, but in order to um, put this into matrix form so we can use it in the Gauss-Seidel method, we need to account for every single unknown in every single equation. So we need to expand this to include um, some of the zero, some of the terms that end up being zeros. So we still have f of k2 plus f of k4 times h1 minus f of k2 times h2 plus zero h3. So h3 doesn't actually come into play in this equation, but we need to account for its existence anyway. So that's zero times h3. Now we have minus f of k4 times h4, that comes into play. Uh, 0 times h5, that does not. 0 times h6, 0 times h7, 0 times h8. Uh, it looks like on the picture it says uh, 0, 11, 8. I forgot to cross my h, but that's an h8. Plus 0 times h9 equals qio over a. For grid square number 2, I've done the same thing. I've put together the equation. This time I've gone ahead and accounted for all the zeros in this case. So we have negative f of k1 h1 plus uh, the sum of f of k1, f of k3, and f of k5 times h2 minus f of k3 h3 plus 0 h4 minus f of k5 h5 plus 0 h6 plus 0 h7 plus 0 h8 plus 0 h9. So we've accounted for all the zeros. We have a term here for or we accounted for all the, all the unknowns. We have a term for all the unknowns. A whole bunch of them are zeros. We do the same thing for number three. I'll let you read through that one yourself. I don't need to read that aloud to you. Uh, did the same for H4. Did the same for H5. Now, it's going to follow the same type of pattern for six, seven, eight, and nine. So I just went up through five. Um, but I wanted to kind of put a few of those together so you could start to see the pattern. Now what I want to do is show you how this is all going to populate our big A matrix. So first of all I need to introduce another piece of shorthand in order to make this all fit. So nobody wants to write 
into this matrix f of k2 plus f of k4 plus f of k10 plus f of k8, for example. So I am replacing that long term, our diagonal term, just with a d sub i. i is going to be whatever row we happen to be on. So in row 1, it'll be d1. In row 2, it'll be d2, etc. So if we go back to the equation for number 1 up at the top, and looking at the one that includes all the zeros, so the second form of that same equation, um, the first term is our diagonal term, so that's d1. The second term, the h2 term, is our negative f of k2. Our h3 term has a zero coefficient. And I'm going across the top row of the same matrix now, so you should be able to see kind of how this is forming. What goes in the A matrix is just the coefficients that come before each of the h values. So if you look at d2, it kind of works out the same way. Um, we start off with negative f of k1 times uh, d2, that's our diagonal for the second equation, uh, negative f of k3, then a 0 for h4, negative f of k5, and then the rest of them are all zeros. Looking at equation number 3, again, we have a 0 now for the h1 term, negative f of k2, and then our diagonal, d3. Then we have a 0 for the h4 term and the h5 term, and then we have uh, negative f of k6. Then we have zeros for the 7, 8, and 9 terms. Looking at 4, it's going to follow a similar pattern. Now if you go through all of these for all 9 equations, since you're going to have 9 equations for each, one for each of the unknowns, 9 equations, 9 unknowns, we're going to have a square matrix in A. Now if you look at the matrix as it ends up when we're finally done with this, you'll see that we have a diagonal that is always represented by the largest term and then right next to the diagonal, we have all the we have a bunch of uh, f of k values. In most places, there's a couple that the f of k values are missing, and that has to do with um, some of the boundary conditions, the left and right boundary conditions, which we're going to take a look at in just a minute. Um, and then somewhere off of those diagonals, we have another strip of diagonals on both sides with our that are marked in green on here. But the thing I want you mainly, mainly to notice is most of this matrix is zeros. So um, when we start constructing the thing, we're going to find that uh, the vast majority of numbers are going to be zeros. And it turns out out of two, uh, so we have 2,500 grid squares. That means we're going to have 2,500 equations. So that means that A matrix is going to have 2,500 rows. That A matrix is always a square, so that means it's also going to have 2,500 columns. That means it's going to have 625,000 elements in it. Most of them are going to be zeros. In fact, no more than 12,500 of those are going to be actual values. All the rest of them are going to be zeros. So let's move to the next picture here. We're going to page number four. This is just like the uh, first page that we were looking at. In fact, this is a direct copy of that first page. Main equation, again, I titled it, and I put a 4 on the bottom, but the handwritten part, it's the exact same picture. So this is just to kind of take another quick look at what our main equation looks like. What we're going to talk about next is how we're going to apply boundary conditions to this main equation. So we have in our, um, in our model two different kinds of boundary conditions. We have Neumann type boundary conditions, which are um, specified flux boundaries. In our case, they're constant flux boundaries, and they're a special kind of constant flux boundaries. Those are no flow boundaries. So what that means is, and this is what's happening on the left side of our grid and the right side of our grid. We have no flow across those boundaries. So when we so the equations as you see them right now are applicable to grid squares in the middle of the grid. So these are grid squares that are not encountering any of the left, right, top, or bottom sides of our grid. In those cases, this equation as you see it in front of you right now applies. However, when the equation or when the grid square is on one of the boundaries then we have to treat it a little bit differently in order to handle the boundary condition so 
we're going to look first at what happens when we're on the bottom of our grid. So those are cases where um, j, or our y value, is equal to 1. So when we're on the bottom, when y equals 1, or j equals 1. So thing, the equations are going to change to look like the following. So we're going to move on to page number 5. And I've made a few changes here. So if you look up at the top in the middle, I have replaced the bottom grid square because that no longer exists. If we're in the bottom row, we don't have that bottom grid square anymore. What we have there instead is a Dirichlet boundary condition. So the Dirichlet boundary condition, I mentioned the Neumann boundary conditions or the no-flow boundary conditions. The Dirichlet boundary condition is a specified value boundary condition. Um, for our hydrologic model, that is a constant head boundary. And so we have assigned at the lower part of the model a constant head value of 383 meters. So instead of having a grid square at the bottom, what we have is instead of having a grid square at the bottom, what we have is a uh, constant head value instead. So in order to calculate this, we go to the physical form of our equations. The only thing that's going to change in our physical form of this equation is going to be the part of the flow that's in the downward direction or between the bottom of the model and our current grid square. So that's just the downward term here. Now what changes here is a couple of things. First we need to look at our um, our k term, or k part of the term. So I'm going to go back to page 4 for a second here. And we look at our k term. It's kij times kij minus 1 in the downward direction here. Now, at the bottom of the grid, we don't have a kij minus 1. We're at the lowest j possible. So there's no, when j is equal to 1, there is no j minus 1. So we can't look at anything that's lower than that. The best thing we can do here is make an approximation for what that k value might be at the boundary. And the closest number we've got is kij. We've already got that number. That's the best thing we've got. So if we take kij and replace kij minus 1 with another kij, we get the square root of kij times kij, which is equal to kij. Okay. The other thing, so this is now we're looking back at our original screen here or back at our, our boundary condition corrected screen here. Let's go back again. Now, the other problem here is we have hij minus 1 minus hij. Again, we're looking in the downward direction in the physical form of the equation. There is no hij minus 1 because there's no grid square there. So what happens there, because there's no grid square, we replace hij minus 1 with h lower. So now we're looking back at our downward boundary condition on page 5. h lower replaces that hij minus 1. Okay. So now what we've got here is kij times h lower minus hij divided by delta y. So now we've got to do that same algebra we did before. So we do the algebra again, and that's going to bring us to our linear equation form for our GS solver. Now, the downward term by itself here becomes a constant because what that term ends up being is kij times hl divided by delta y. We know all of those values. kij is given, h lower is given, it is 383 meters, and delta y is given, that's 10 meters. All those numbers are known, so this doesn't belong on the unknown side of the equation anymore. So we just subtract it across, or in this case add it across, to the other side of the equation. So that becomes part of the B matrix. So the constant part of this equation becomes negative QIO divided by A plus KIJ times HL divided by Y. That's H lower. The other thing that ends up happening when we do all this algebra is in our contribution to the diagonal for the downward term, we end up with um, just a KIJ over delta Y. So just to kind of recap what we did here, on the physical form of the equation, we had to rewrite the downward part, or the downward term, 
in order to account for this um, constant head boundary, since we don't have uh, an h i j minus 1 at the lower boundary. So we rewrote that term using our constant head boundary. And then we redid all the algebra that we did before to put it back into linear equation form so we can use it in our GS solver. Um, the downward part of the term in linear equation becomes a constant and gets subtracted to the other side of the equation becomes part of the B matrix. The contribution to the diagonal has a minor modification in the, uh, the hydraulic conductivity part of the term for the downward part. It becomes Kij over delta y. Okay, so that's our downward boundary conditions. Let's move on to the next one. So we're going to go back to our regular picture, back on page 4. So this is our normal equation for everywhere except for the boundaries. And by the way, this normal equation that's not on the boundaries, this covers 2,304 of our grid squares. So really, once we have this equation, we've got most of it done. We only really have 196 more equations that we need to deal with, or 196 more grid squares. That downward boundary condition knocks out 50 of them right there. But now we're going to look at the left boundary condition. So the left boundary is our no-flow Neumann boundary condition. So what happens here is, uh, skip ahead to that picture on page 6, when we don't have that left side boundary condition, or that le when we don't have that left side grid square, when we're on the left boundary, we are replacing it with a no-flow boundary condition, which states that Q equals 0. Now, looking at the physical form of our equation, and we look at the left term of our equation, so I'm going back up to our main equation again. This left term in our physical equation here just goes to zero. That the terms, Each of these terms represents a flow in that direction. There is no flow in the left direction, so that term just goes to zero. So we replace it with a zero in our physical form, and then we redo all the algebra to reconstruct this linear equation form that goes into our GS solver. So on the right side here, after we've redone the algebra, the left term from before gets replaced with zero. And the left contribution to the diagonal also gets replaced with a zero. That's really all you have to do for the left boundary condition. You remove a couple of things, replace them with zeros, now you have the left boundary condition. So our no-flow boundaries are a lot simpler to deal with than what we were dealing with for our uh, up and down Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay, now we're going to look at our right hand term. The right hand term is going to be pretty much the same. So now we're on to page 7 in the notes. Um, back up to the middle in the top section here. Uh, when, we do, when we're on the right side boundary we do not have any grid squares to the right. What we have instead is a no flow boundary condition. So there's no flow to the right. So we take the physical form of our equation, go back to our original form here, this uh, negative kij, ki plus 1j, etc. term, that's going to go to zero. There's no flow in that direction, so that term becomes a zero. We redo the algebra again, and we come up with another form of our linear equation for our GS solver on the right side. In this case, the right-hand term goes away, and the right-hand contribution to the diagonal goes away. Those just become zeros, and they're out of the picture. So now we'll take a look at our upward term. So our upward term, again, is going to be dealing with this Dirichlet boundary condition, and we're going to have to do a little bit more with that than we did for these no-flow boundary conditions. So going back up to our main equation on page 4, we're going to be flipping back and forth to this, so you know, keep this page or the first page handy because you're going to be looking at these a lot. And now we're looking at our downward bound, or I'm sorry, our upward boundary condition. Here we don't have ij plus 1. So it's the term on the bottom that we're going to have to work with here. So again, this kij, kij plus 1 square rooted term, or part of the term, we don't have kij plus 1. So we're going to replace that with kij. That's our best approximation. Square root of kij times kij equal to kij. So that's gonna, how that term is going to change. Um, looking at our hij plus 1 minus hij, again, we don't have hij plus 1. What we have instead is our h upper value, which is 404 meters. So skipping 
down to page 8. This is where we're dealing with our upper boundary condition. We replace our upper boundary, or our, our upper grid square, with h upper at 404 meters. And we replace that term in the equation with kij times h upper minus hij times delta y. We do the algebra again to come up with our linear equation form for the GS solver. And what that looks like is our last term, our upward term, is a constant. It's kij times h upper divided by delta y, negative. We are going to move that over to the other side of the equation. All those values are known. We know kij, we know h upper, we know delta y. All those are known, so this is no longer any part of the unknown. So it ends up in the constant, and that's going to end up in the B matrix. So we move that to the other side of the equation. The other thing that we need to do is in the contribution to the diagonal, the, uh, the K term for the upward direction is just going to get replaced with Kij. So that pretty much covers the boundary conditions. These are the, the ways we need to adjust our equation based on where our grid squares are located. So like I said, for 2,304 of our grid squares, we're going to use the main form of the equation that you saw at the beginning of this lecture and on the fourth page. And you should have that in front of you somewhere pretty much at all times, basically, at this point. Um, that's covering, again, most of our grid. Our boundary grid, or boundary grid squares, there are a total of um, 196 of them. Some of them overlap. They overlap on the corners a little bit. But the four forms of the equation we just looked at um, for each of our boundaries are going to be helpful for dealing with those. Even on the corners, this is going to work because you can actually make combinations of these changes all at once. So, for example, just looking at our, our upward direction um, boundary condition that's in front of you on the screen right now. So this works. This is, the equation is true for any grid square in the top row, except for on the corners. On the corners, we have a couple other things we could do here. So let's say we're in the upper left corner. In that case, we're also, so we've already got our Dirichlet boundary condition dealt with for being in the upper part. In the left corner, we'd also have to deal with um, the no-flow boundary condition to the left. So with the same equation, I'm not going to show any of this on the screen. I'm just going to mention it out loud. In the le upper left corner, we have this form of the equation, plus you can wipe out this left term, replace that with a zero. And then when you move everything over to the right side of the equation, we'd end up with uh, no left term and no uh, left contribution to the diagonal, in addition to the changes we've already made here for the Dirichlet boundary condition. OK, so that brings us to putting together a strategy for putting this into code. So that's the general plan here, is we want to write this in code so we can construct our A matrix and um, construct our B matrix and run this through the GS solver. So you know, with, our, with smaller equations, even with pictures that are you know, 4 by 4 with 16 equations, 16 unknowns, these are things we could assemble by hand if we wanted to build our matrices by hand. With 2,500 equations and 2,500 unknowns, it's completely untenable to construct an A matrix ourselves by hand. So we're not even going to try. We need to teach the computer how to do it. So there's a few things we need to make sure we understand before we start diving into this. So first of all, we just went through and talked about all the boundary conditions. We now have five versions of our main equation. We have a version for the middle grid squares. These are the ones that don't deal with boundary conditions. We have a version for the left and right boundaries and versions for the bottom and top boundaries. Like I just mentioned, we can combine these strategies at the corners so we could actually put them together to make another four equations. Um, but once we do that, and once we put all these together, we generate a system of linear equations that we can solve using the Gauss-Seidel method. In order to solve things with the Gauss-Seidel method, we need three things. We need an A matrix. This is our big matrix containing all of the 
uh, coefficients. We need a B matrix. This is the vector that has the same number of rows as our square A matrix, and that contains all the constants. And then we're going to need an X matrix that is going to receive the, our final answers for our unknowns. So looking across the top of the screen here, a couple of things about constructing our matrices. The X matrix is going to contain our unknowns. Now, when we talked about the Gauss-Seidel method in class, I mentioned that when you don't have any other information, you start your Gauss-Seidel method by setting all of the X values equal to zero. For this project, I've provided you with initial X values to use. So instead of setting your X values equal to zero, you're going to set them equal to these initial conditions that I give you. The initial conditions are given as a grid. They're in a 50 by 50 grid. Gauss Seidel solver needs these to be in a vector. So we have to vectorize them, uh, vectorize these initial H values first. Uh, in your first homework, uh, one of the problems that you did was a vectorizing problem. So you have the tools to do this. Um, just got to go look it up in your first homework or the solutions, I guess. Now the A and B matrices are mostly zeros. I mentioned before that you're going to have at most 12,500 non-zero values in your A matrix out of 625,000 values. So all the rest of them are going to be zeros. Your B matrix also is going to mostly be zeros. Um, just to kind of give you a little predictor, um, your Dirichlet boundary conditions are going to make some of those values not zero. Um, and we saw that when we were putting together the equations, some of those values became constant and got moved over to the, to the constant side of the equation. Those end up being the first 50 and the last 50 values of your B matrix. The other values in your B matrix that are going to be non-zero are your wells, there's two of those, and your grass area. There are 64 grid squares that contain grass. So there, that means you're going to have 166 non-zero values out of 2,500 in your B matrix. So long story short, your A and B matrices are mostly zeros, so you might as well initialize them both as all zeros and then go back and fill in later um, the actual non-zero values. So that's kind of a good start for our strategy here. So I just kind of put a couple of the commands on the screen here or on the in the notes here that you're going to use. So you can find out your grid size using the size command. You can apply that to H or K, either of the two, either of the two matrices that you were given uh, that you could download off of the Canvas page. So um, you can use the size command on that to get those values. They are 50 and 50. You could hard code them in there. I prefer to use the size command because that way, if I decide to go change up the model and give it a rectangle or whatever, I don't, I'm not tied into the same size. I can reuse my code. So your A matrix is going to be a square matrix. So it's a uh, number of rows, number of columns are going to be the same. The number of rows in your A matrix and the number of rows in your B matrix are going to be the same as the number of unknowns you have. So we have a 50 by 50 grid, which means we have 50 times 50 unknowns, which is 2,500. So your A matrix is going to be 2,500 by 2,500. Your B matrix is going to be 2,500 by 1. That's going to be a column vector. Now, this is the part where things get difficult to, um, I think, difficult to wrap your brain around. It's difficult to wrap my brain around, too. It's not just you, it's everybody. So you're in good company. Um, when we're dealing with the A and B matrices, and we're mostly going to look at the A matrix, the B matrix just kind of follows along. It's a lot easier to deal with because it's a vector. And it's got the same number of rows as we have unknowns or equations, both. But we have two spaces that we need to work in here. We have our physical space. This is our map grid. This is a XY grid, regular Cartesian grid like we're used to seeing since we started studying math um, and started using graphs anyway. Um, so that's what I've represented with this little picture here with numbers from 1 to 16 and then I've got the i and j values. We have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, that's our 
i values or our x values, one, two, three, four, that's our j values or our y values. Then we also have our mathematical space. The mathematical space is basically our A matrix. Now, the physical space, this represents something that's actually on the ground. If we were working on a real site with all these numbers, you could drill, at least for this grid I'm showing here, you could drill 16 holes in the ground and have a representative grid that you could map and look at. This is something you can touch. The mathematical space on the right side, this is completely theoretical. There's nothing physical about what's going on in this mathematical space. It's a way to uh, store numbers and move them in and out of a linear solver. So this is all mathematical and nothing physical. Um, what it should look like is somewhat like what you're seeing in the picture here. I didn't put any numbers in it, but the purple line represents the diagonal. The two blue lines right next to it represent the off diagonals, and the green lines represent a couple of other uh, strips of information that are going to appear in there. Everything else in these uh, oddly shaped boxes with the word zeros in it, in them, everything in there is going to be zeros. Most of your A matrix is going to contain zeros. That's what I'm trying to show you here. But we need to be able to move back and forth between our physical space and our mathematical space. So the red numbers in this physical space drawing here are the row, those represent the row in A and B. In order to go back and forth in between these, we need to be able to identify um, each grid square in a couple of ways. So in our physical space, each grid square is going to have an i and a j value. So for example, grid square number 10 here is i equals 2, j equals 3, so 2, 3. It's also got an identifier as number 10. 10 is going to represent the row in the A matrix that contains the coefficients for the equation that populates our hydraulic head values in 10. So, or 2, 3. So each grid space here has two addresses. It has a physical space address that's uh, given as an I value and a J value, and it's also got a mathematical space address that's given as a single number representing the row in the A matrix and the B matrix. Um, that number also represents the column associated with that unknown when it's in a different equation. So in order to go back and forth between these two spaces, it's important to create some kind of mapping. And the easiest way to do that is to make an index array. An index array is just going to be another array that's the same size as your physical space. So it's going to be a 50 by 50 array. And each grid square, or each element of that array, is just going to be a number, starting with 1 and going to 2,500. Arranged just like you see this 1 to 16 grid, except instead of going from 1 to 16, it's going to go from 1 to 2,500 through your entire array. And that's going to give you a translation mapping back and forth between your physical space and your mathematical space. Now we can set this up so that MATLAB handles all of that. As long as you create this index array, MATLAB will be able to handle all of it. And we won't have to really think about it at all, as long as we create this index array. So that's going to be import an important part of what you put together. I usually assemble my index array at the same time that I'm vectorizing my h values, because it's going to use the same for loops. You're going to have a for loop that goes through your rows, for loop that goes through your columns. I usually do the columns on the outside, the rows on the inside, and I'll show you that when we get to the, the code in a little bit. Um, but, but it doesn't matter which way you go. What does matter is if you go columns first, then rows, so if you do, if you do your for loops in that order, you have to do your for loops in the same order for everything. So there's a few things where you're going to see these for loops, and they always have to go in the same order. So there's no right or wrong order to go in, as long as it's the same order. So if you do two different orders, then one of those is right, one of those is wrong. It's up to you to decide which one, but do them all consistently, and then it's all going to be right. Okay, so that's the first part of coding strategy. So we're going to move on to page 10 now. On page 10, we're going to continue talking about our coding strategy. So... On the right side here, I've written out our linear form of our equation again. Um, 
Now, part of the strategy I like to use for, um, for doing this is to divide my equation up by directions. So I have my upward term, my downward term, my left term, my right term. The order they're actually shown here, it's uh, down, left, right, up. And then the diagonal is in the middle, which has a contribution from each of those. So each direction has one term of its own in the equation. So for example, for the downward direction, that term is the first term, the negative square root of kij, kij minus 1 divided by delta y, multiplied by hij minus 1. That's the downward term. Yeah, the downward term. Each direction also has a contribution to the diagonal. The contribution to the diagonal is the same as the coefficient, or it's the absolute value of the coefficient that went with the, that direction's term. So the downward direction's contribution to that diagonal is the square root of kij times kij minus 1 divided by delta y. They're um, outlined in red with an arrow pointing to them. Those are the same coefficient, except that it's an absolute value in the diagonal. So the diagonal is equal to the sum of the absolute values of all the other coefficients. And so I've kind of drawn on here some arrows and some boxes to show you how all those kind of fit together. Now, with the boundary conditions, the individual terms and the corresponding contributions to the diagonal are going to change with the boundary conditions. So we're going to start with this as our baseline equation, and we're going to break it up into each of these parts. So the downward part is the red boxes, the left part is the green boxes, the right part is the black boxes, and the up part is the purple boxes. Now mostly we pretty much ignore the h values because the h values are all going to be stuck into the x matrix and those are getting calculated by this. The part that's going to be giving us um, work to do is mostly populating the a matrix, a little bit into populating the b matrix. So remember with our Dirichlet boundary conditions our upper or lower term ends up being a constant and ends up over on the other side of the equation as a constant and ends up in the B matrix. So that's where a little bit of that work comes in. But for the most part, the B matrix is mostly zeros, just like the A matrix. Okay, so let's go to page 11. So this is kind of just giving you a few tips on what we're going to be putting together. So um, remember that we have this equation that applies at every single grid square. We have five forms of that equation, but it's basically the same equation everywhere with a few adjustments for boundary conditions. H is your unknown, and this exists at every grid square as well. So we're going to have 2,500 H values and 2,500 equations to figure out what those are. So here's a partial list of what's given, and all of this you can find in your project sheet, your project assignment sheet. So your h, your initial h values and your k values are all given. You downloaded that in your group's map file. Um, you know the grid, you know the size of your grid. It's 50 by 50. Um, you can pull this using the size command from your initial h values or your k values also. So if you want to make that automated and systematic, that's a good way to do it. We know the size of each grid square. That's dx or delta x and dy or delta y. Both of them are 10 meters. We also know the thickness of the aquifer at 20 meters. We know the diameter of each well at 15 centimeters or 0 0.15 meters. We know the area that the wells are operating across. So this is the cross-sectional area through which the wells are pumping water. And that's uh, pi times the diameter of the well times b, the aquifer thickness. We also know the area of the grassy area, and that's 6,400 cubic meters. Things I didn't include on this list are the locations of the wells, the locations of the grass, and the pumping rates on the two wells. Those are all given in the project assignment sheet. The pumping rates are given in gallons per day. Those will need to be converted to cubic meters per day. 
Um, the grass is 2% of the pumping rate at the neighbor's well. That's the infiltration rate there. Um, so once you have your pumping rate converted, you can just multiply it by uh, 0 0.02. That's going to give you the infiltration rate. And then you'll that's your QIO. That's going to get divided by 6,400. And then that final number is going to get applied to each grid square that has grass on it. There are 64 of them. Okay. So here's a few things you have to do in your code. This is the right side of the screen now. You must vectorize your initial H values to use them in GS Solver. So your initial H values are coming in a 50 by 50 grid. You need to put those into a 2500 by 1 or a 1 by 2500 uh, matrix vector. Um, you need to get the size of this H0 or this initial H value or K grid. Both of those grids are the same size. If you use the size command on either one of them, they should give you the same answer. And that answer should be 50 by 50. If it's not, well, shoot me an email because we got to deal with that. But if it's not, that's probably not my fault because last time I checked, they were all 50 by 50. Anyway, I wouldn't try to do that to you. Okay, once you have those all in place, now you want to create this index array. You want to number each grid square starting with 1 and going to 2500. I usually start at 1, 1, call that 1. Then 1, 2, I'll call that 2. 1, 3, I'll call that 3. 1, 4, I'll call it 4, etc. All the way to 2500. Each grid square gets its own unique single number, scalar number. The index array is what's going to allow us to move back and forth between our A matrix and our uh, physical grid. Now you want to create your A and B matrices. Since they're mostly zeros, and there's a huge amount of numbers in them, well, we have uh, 625,000 numbers in the A matrix, 2,500 in the B matrix. That's, um, well, that's a lot of numbers. Most of them are zeros. Initialize them all to zeros. Then we'll go back through and fix the ones that aren't zeros with their actual values. Once we have our zero, all of our zeros in there, now we're going to walk through each grid square in our physical grid, and we're going to uh, pick out all the coefficients for the equations that goes with each grid square. So we're going to do this 2,500 times. Conveniently enough, we can use for loops, so we only have to write the code once, and then MATLAB will go through and do it 2,500 times for us. The kij, ki plus 1j over delta x terms, those are what go in the A matrix. So everything in the A matrix is going to be some kind of function of the hydraulic conductivities and the separation distances. That's what goes in the A matrix. Your QIOs divided by A, so your well pumping and any other constants, which like this is going to be your constant head boundary conditions. All that goes in the B matrix. And talking about the equations, I already showed you how you subtract that stuff over into the B matrix when you are um, when you're working with your constant head boundary conditions. Your wells are going to end up in the B matrix too. Typically, I will update the B matrix with all the QIO stuff after I deal with putting together the main part of the equation. So I'll build my A matrix. I'll put together my B matrix, and then after all that's done, once my A matrix and B matrix are built and all put together, then I'll update the few values in the B matrix with the QIOs. There's only 66 of them, and I'll update those afterwards. So the wells, I just do one at a time. There's two wells, I fix two values in the B matrix with those wells, and it's just an update. So when you do that, you don't want to uh, overwrite what's in your B matrix. So you're not going to do something like B... 41 equals uh, QIO over A. You're going to want to do something more like B41 equals B41 minus QIO over A. So do it as an update, not as an overwrite when you're working with your B matrix. Okay, so we're going to go to page 12 now. So this is the code. This is not all of the code, this is just a start. You can See that if you look very carefully, I have two for loops that start and no ends after them. So this is just a start for how you're going to put together your code. Um, now, before you get into any of this, you need to already have your A and B matrix, 
A and B matrices initialized to all zeros. So um, if you're looking at this on the screen, it's probably pretty small. I think it would be better probably at this point to flip to the actual page that you have in front of you if you printed it out or zoom in on it or whatever. Um, so here's how we're going to put this together. We're going to go through a pair of for loops. We're going to have a, a J loop and an I loop. One's going through your Y values, one's going through the X values. Um, the order that you put these in does not matter. So you could have J on the outside, I on the inside like I have it, or I on the outside and J on the inside. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. So if you do it once this way with J on the outside, I on the inside, you have to do it the same way every time. That's critical. That's important. Because every, everything's getting built in the same order. If you don't do everything in the same order, things are going to break. It's not going to work. So consistency is key here. Consistency is the right answer. Not necessarily J out, I in. That's a correct answer. But doing it the same way every time is the correct answer. Now, once we get into our for loops, the first thing we want to do is figure out what row in the A matrix is going to represent the equation that we're working on right now. So we're going to look that up in our index array. So the index array, remember, is the array that you've numbered each grid square starting at 1 and going all the way to 2,500. So they each got a unique single scalar number. We can look that up in that index array now and figure out what that is. So we give it ij. So ij is the, the address in our um, physical space. That's our, our x value, y value. We hand that off to the index array. It's going to return for us the number that represents the row for our equation. So anytime we need to find out how to translate back and forth, we can just look up in the index array what that translation is using something like row equals index array ij. Okay, now I mentioned earlier we should break this up into individual directions and work on those one at a time. So that's what we're going to do here. So. Now all this, everything I'm talking about here is stuff we're going to do at every single grid cell. So we've got our 4J loop and our 4I loop that's taking us through all the dimensions. Everything that's inside of this code is something we're doing at every single grid square. So the first thing we're doing at every single grid square is figuring out what row we're working on. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at our downward direction first. So there are two things that could happen in our downward direction. We could be on the boundary, in that case J equals 1. That means we're on our lower boundary condition. Or we could be anywhere else that's not on the lower boundary condition. But let's look at what happens with the lower boundary condition first. So if j equals 1, we're on the bottom edge of our grid, and we're dealing with the lower boundary condition. So the downward flow term at the bottom becomes a constant. I mentioned that before when we were going through our equations. So the downward flow term becomes a constant. That means all parts of it are known and it ends up getting moved over into the B matrix. So it's going to be positive and it's going to be in the B matrix instead of the A matrix. So we're going to update our B matrix here. Um, now rho is the number rho that we're working on in the A and B matrix. Uh, because B is a vector, um, we want to make sure it stays that way as we write to it. So it's important when you're writing to a, a column vector that you specify the column number, even if it's always one. So we're going to say b row one equals b row one plus kij times h lower divided by dy. So that's the part of the term that we moved over to the b matrix. So I'm going to bounce back quickly to a, a few slides back just to kind of show you what we're looking at here. So this was our this was our lower uh, equation here. So if you look down in the lower right corner, that's what goes in the B matrix, this Kij HL divided by delta Y. So we just put that into the B matrix. That's what we're doing here in our code at this point. Okay. Now, we also need to account for the contribution to the diagonal. Remember, when you're on the diagonal, the row index and the column index are always going to be the same. So if our row, let's say for example our row is 5, our column is also going to be 5 if we're dealing with the diagonal. So here we're going to deal with A row row. So it's A5 5 or A10 10, 10 or A10 
2,494. 2,494. Always going to be the same index for row and column when we're on the diagonal. What goes on the diagonal when we're on the downward boundary condition is Kij divided by delta y. So again, going back to that picture here, if you look at our downward boundary condition in the linear equation form on the right side, bottom part of the screen, if we look at our downward contribution to the diagonal, it's Kij divided by delta y. So that's what goes in through the diagonal there. Okay, back to the bottom. All right. Now, that whole part we just did was if j is equal to 1, then we're on the bottom dealing with the bound lower boundary condition. If we're not on the bottom, we're anywhere but the bottom. So that's the else part. Now, when we're not dealing with the boundary condition, everything goes in the A matrix. All the coefficients for each equation go on the same row. So we know what row we're going to be on, but the downward flow term, the one that's just down by itself, that's associated with the h i j minus 1. So we need to use the index array to find out what column this one's going to go in. We know what row it goes in. Everything goes in the same row inside of these two for loops. So row is the row, but the column we need to look up. So we can look that up in our index array. All we need to find is what column is associated with i j minus 1. So when you do your array index for this next term here, you can do a row, and then for the column, you can go straight to the index array and give it ij minus 1, a couple extra parentheses. So right here, MATLAB's going to take care of that for you. You never need to actually know what row we're on or what, co what column we're on. You can use this index array to let MATLAB handle it and sweep it out of your mind. Save your brain for other more important things. Now, what goes into the uh, into that term in the A matrix is going to be this. So I'm going to go back to page 4 to our, our main equation here. It's going to be the downward term in the linear form of the equation on the right side of the screen. So that's that negative square root of Kij, Kij minus 1 over delta y. That's what's going into that term. And that's also going to be our contribution to the diagonal. So let's go back to the code here. And we can see we are putting in negative square root Kij, Kij minus 1 over delta y. And we're putting that into a row index array ij minus 1. We're also putting that into a row row as an update. Now when I say it's an update, that means we're saying a row row equals a row row plus something. In this case, that something is the square root of Kij times Kij minus 1 divided by delta y. Okay, so we have two cases of things that we're going to do in the downward direction. We're going to either deal with the boundary condition, where we put some numbers in the B and a contribution to the diagonal, or we're going to not deal with the boundary condition. That's our else part, where we're just going to put everything in the A matrix. So that's it for the down. Up is going to look pretty much just like that, except it's going to be um, J plus 1 instead, and you're going to use the upper h upper boundary condition. But it's going to look substantially similar to what you just seen. So let's take a look at our left side now. Now, if i is equal to 1, that means we're on the left side. There is no flow in the left direction. And so when we put together our terms, so let's go back to a left side flow here. When we put together our terms here, um, we canceled out the left term in the physical form of the equation when we did the algebra to bring it over to our linear form of the equation. There was no left term, and there's no left contribution to the diagonal. So those are zero. Nothing happens there. Um, so we don't really need to do anything at that point. So getting back to our code here, there's nothing to do when i equals 1. There's stuff to do whenever i does not equal 1. So when i does not equal 1, again, all of our coefficients for each equation go on the same row, but the downward flow term, whoops, that's supposed to say the left flow term, but uh, anyway, the left flow term is associated with h, uh, and that's supposed to say 
hi minus one j. I kind of copied and pasted that and forgot to fix it. I apologize for that. Um, anyway, um, we're actually associated with i minus one hi minus one j. That's what we're kind of looking at here. So we're going to use the index array just like we did above um, when we were dealing with the non-boundary condition downward stuff. But in this case, instead of dealing with uh, i j minus one, we're dealing with i minus one j. So the terms are actually, the actual code lines here look pretty similar to what we did in the uh, non-boundary condition part of downward. The only difference, again, is it's i minus 1, j instead of i, j minus 1. And the, div, uh, the denominator here is going to be dx instead of dy. Okay, so I've shown you down and I've shown, shown you left. Um, there's still right and up to deal with, but right is basically going to look just like left, except you're going to be dealing with i plus 1 instead of i minus 1. And up is going to look just like down, except you're going to deal with j plus 1 instead of j minus 1, and you're going to deal with the upper boundary condition instead. So this should get you kind of started on putting together your code to construct your um, construct your A and B matrix, A and B matrices. Uh, it's going to be kind of up to you to finish this code out for your down and left directions, and then um, get your your matrices all put together. Once you have them all put together, you can actually start running your GS solver. Even if you don't put the wells and the grass in, once you put the matrices together here, you can try out your GS solver, see how it works, see how long it takes. I want you to note that it's probably going to take a few minutes to run with the GS solver. Um, so, you know, set aside a few minutes and if you click run and nothing happens for a little while, just, just give it some time. Uh, if it takes more than about 10 minutes, it's probably taking too long, but it should should probably take a few minutes to run. So, you know, be a little patient with it. Don't start thinking MATLAB froze on you. It actually is running. It just takes a little bit. It takes a bit of time. So, um, I think hopefully what I've given you with this lecture here is going to be enough to kind of get you on the move here. Um, I hope this was a bit of help. I hope you were able to understand most of what I was talking about here. And, um, yeah, best of luck working on your projects, and I will see you when I get back.